Well, we've been studying and searching a little bit, haven't we? Because the whole purpose of our search and our study is to gain more understanding, but also, I don't know how to put this, but you should get a little upset because somebody has robbed us. They have taken the joy from our lives. They robbed us of our Christ. They robbed us of our Father. But the Father being all powerful and all merciful has found a way in these last days that he said, I'm going to open this book one more time. And I'm going to give you the understanding that that would only, not only make your eternal life in uh, what you would have it to be, but also the life that you have on this earth. And see, we often forget that. God is interested on this earth and what we're going through and what he wants for us. And we've been robbed of that. And so as we go through and look through and ask the God and the God, the, the God, the God of the Bible, the things that are in the Bible, what happens this is we understand more about him. We also have to understand something. Not only have things been hidden from us, but there are some lies out there that have been told us. And the reason the lies uh, uh, have been uh, 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 put before us is to keep us from knowing the true nature of God. Because if anybody ever really found out who God is and what he is, they would not choose the enemy. If anybody ever gave you, uh, 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 you've been drinking Flint, Michigan water, and and, and then somebody came up and gave you some, some pure well water, from downhill south where we have good water. Now, they would always choose what? The good water. They would always choose it because they'll see the difference in it. And they'll see that, that it tastes better, that it is better, that it helps me. And it will always be the choice of those who get it. So God says, I'm going to now present to you me. So you may choose the good water. You may choose the living water. You may choose the living way. You may choose the way that is more conducive to eternal life. And this is why it's been hidden from us. Somebody doesn't want us to know the nature of the Father. And so what is the nature of the Father? The first attribute is mercy, is love, is gentleness and kindness and long-suffering. They don't want you to know that. Now, remember, this particular uh, uh, lie... (laughs) we're going to talk about today, has kept more people away from God than we could count. So it's not like these little lies that we've been given when we were little. Remember, we were little. They told us that the devil had horns, a tail, and pitchfork, right? That's what was told us. Then we went to church, and the church told us that angels had wings. And I, we believe that. Well, I, and, 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 and I, you know, I was, the Lord was giving that to me this morning. I said, hold on. I want to make sure, Lord, because if I step out here like this, I got to be, make sure this is you. We looked up the word wings in every place it exists in the Bible. <laughs> you wonder what I do in the morning? <laughs> do stuff like this. <laughs> it is never associated with an angel. Never. And no, then, but what happened is we, the cherubims, and the, we got mixed up. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the cherubim is an angel. But what do we do? We, we say the wings, you know, the, 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 the sanctuary service says they're wings. Yes, they are. That doesn't make them an angel. What does an angel do? What's the occupation of an angel? They're messengers. Does the covering sheriff move? No, it doesn't. It doesn't move. It's not his job, does it? Okay, go and study Ezekiel. Go and study Exodus. Well, those are two places you'll find the most conversations about the covering sheriffs. And you'll find out it calls it a creature. It's some, it has a role. It's important. But it's not an angel. And so these little things have kept us a little confused. Because if God permits, next week we're going to find out why that's important because there's another layer of, of principalities in the spiritual world we need to find out about. Amen. See, we think it's just angels up there. God says, I never said that. 
Matter of fact, I said 14,000 times in the Bible, there's another group that live with me. So, but that's next week. So if y'all are interested, come back next week. But this week, he told us to talk about the, one of the biggest, most destructive lies that's been uh, perpetuated on his people. The enemy wants to make sure he locks up our destiny. So, but one of the biggest tricks perpetrated by the enemy concerns the destiny and the punishment of the wicked. And, 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 and we got tricked into focusing on the execution of the judgment as opposed to how you get judged and the method we got hooked up in instead of what the final judgment really is all about. Now, of course, we're talking about what? We're talking about hell. The biggest trick we've ever been played upon Christianity is their description of what hell is all about. And so we can't, we can't get caught in that any longer because when you have the wrong idea about hell and the final judgment, you got the wrong idea about the Father. Because if you got the wrong idea about hell, you're going to think the Father is some terrible, hideous creature who loves to kill, who loves to torment. God says, if you just look in my Bible, I'll tell you what I was talking about. So let's look in his Bible this morning and discover what this is really all about. It's not about the execution. It's about the judgment. And who gets judged? These are, these are the things that the church is trying to avoid. I think Sister Jerry was mentioning earlier before class is that nobody is really teaching this kind of stuff. They, you know, it's no judgment. There's no sin. If there are no rules, there's no sin. If there's no sin, there's no Christ. And therefore, you have a religion based on you and what you want. But God says, look, there is a judgment. There's a final judgment. There's something he calls a second death. And, and it, it, it is incumbent upon us to understand what that's all about and how that comes about. Because if we get that, we will really say, man, Lord, you are good. Instead of, Lord, I can't, how do you serve a God that's going to torment babies? But that's the lie that's been given. And so if we think God is not love, we don't believe in the word of God. And you know what happens to those who don't believe in the word. Amen. Let's go to Matthew 3 to start this morning. We got to get this concept. And always remember, you got to know somebody has lied and you got to know why they lied. And then you need to find the truth. Okay? So this is what we're, we're, ask, what, this is what we're asking God for, to, to, to expose the lies and so we won't be deceived by them, but also embrace the truth and live in that truth. And that truth will give us a different relationship with him. So Matthew chapter 3, we begin at verse 10. Matthew 3 and verse 10. <laughs> this is our, our dear brother we talked about this morning. And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat unto the garner, but he will burn up the shaft with what? Unquenchable fire. See, John's message here was about the final judgment of the wicked. And, and, and he did, he, and, and he, as you'll find, most of the brothers who quote, who are in the Bible of the New, or the Second Testament, are quoting the Old Testament. And one day we're going to get into the difference between the Septuagint and the, uh, the Hebrew. And, and Paul and them used the, the, the Greek version a lot. Because in that region, everybody could read that, that the translation that, that came from the Hebrew to this. And, and so some of the wording is a little different. But what, what, what John was quoting was uh, Malachi 4. So let's go to Malachi 4. Because it's important to understand how he saw this what he was talking about. Because he was just talking about the final judgment of the wicked and what the judgment was really all about. And he used words such as unquenchable fire, but he said burned up. Okay, let's go to, if we would, uh, Malachi 4. And we're just going to read verses 1 through 3. In Malachi chapter 4, and verse 1, he says, For behold, the day cometh, 
that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble, and the day that cometh uh, shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. You see where, where John got this from, okay? And, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, pick up these words. Pick up what he's saying, okay? As, and, and compare it to what we've been told about the judgment of the wicked or the final second death of the wicked or, the, or what, how do they call it, uh, the eternal damnation of the wicked. Let's pick these words up. Let's pick these phrases up. He said, first of all, he said it's going to be hot as an oven, so we kind of get an idea of how the execution is going to happen. And then it also says, all the wicked, and he said, the proud, that's a big part of the wicked. And he said, the proud, so what? Yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Now, stubble is just stuff you burn up. And he kept going. And the day they come, it shall burn them up, burn them up, burn them up. Now, you know what burn up means? <laughs> Excuse the expression, be, it be gone. <laughs> okay, then he says, uh, uh, but unto you that fear his name, my name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, we are, what we have been reading so far is about something that's going to occur that is going to produce stubble and ashes. Okay? Now, let's keep that in mind. He's talking about the wicked. He said, there's wicked and there's righteous. He said, those who are righteous, uh, hey, it's going to be like uh, the, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. So that's got, hey, hey, you're on this side with that. But on the other side, the proud and the wicked, he uses words, burn up. He uses words stubble, and he uses words ashes, okay? So let's keep that in mind as we are trying to decode or decipher the lie that has been told us, that's been told to Christianity, that has turned so many people off from our Father. See, as we see here, the final judgment is that uh, uh, whether, whatever the method of execution is, whatever the method of execution is, that method has an end. Keep that in mind, because ashes and stubble, when you burn something up, eventually what will happen to the fire? It will go out because there's nothing else to burn. Amen? Now, Jesus used the word hell more than anybody else in the Bible. He's the one who quoted that word more than anybody else in the Bible. But what was the word he was using? And this is important to know. Now, uh, uh, let's go, if we would, to Mark 9. But the word that he used was a word called Gehenna. And it's, from, it's a compound word. It comes from, uh, it says, Valley of the Sons of Hinnon. It was a literal place south of the city of Jerusalem in ancient times. This valley was the site of idol worshipers and burning sacrifices to idols, okay? This is where they did this. It involved burning of infants and all that kind of stuff. It was a horrible place. And God, it, there was no other place so horrible in Jesus' eyes than that place. And that's what this word means. It's that place and the things that happened there and, 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 and how that place was always burning because there was always wickedness going on. There was always idol worship. There was always sacrifices. There were always things being burned. The fire was continual because there was continual sin going on. It was terrible, a terrible place. But, but Jesus described the final judgment of the wicked by using that word. He didn't get caught up in what was going on. He said, but this is what's going to be the end of this thing. But what happened? We've been taught to focus upon the method of execution and the place of the execution. Oh, it's going to be burning, and, and it's going to be hot. And we, what, well, let's find out what he was talking about, okay? He just used this. Remember, Christ always used the familiar to describe the unfamiliar. And so this was very familiar for everybody who lived there. They knew what was going on over there. It went on there all the time. So he used that as an example of what is going to take place in the final judgment of the wicked. In verse, chapter 9 of Mark, and he said, verse, uh, starting at verse 45, 
And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast, where? Into hell, into this place, into the fire that never should be quenched, where their worm doth, dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, let's go and find out what he was quoting found in Isaiah 66. In the book of Isaiah 66, let's turn to Isaiah 66. He was quoting Isaiah 66. He was, he was talking about the final judgment and how this thing was going to go down. And in, in verse 23 of Isaiah 66, it says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon, no, let's start at 23, I'm sorry, 66, 23. And it shall come to pass that from one uh, new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon what? The carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. See, what happens is this. He said, as long as there are si there's sin, this fire will not go. It will not be quenched. Because what is being fed is being fed by the carcass carcasses, I'm sorry, of the, of the sin, of the sinner. And so, but once this thing is done, as we read earlier, it's going to be burned up. There are going to be ashes. There's going to be stubble. And so there's no more need for the fire. But see, once you, if you believe that sin will live forever, you think this is going to go on forever. You think that the bodies will be burning forever. God is going to give them some supernatural body that never burns up. He's going to give them eternal life and sin. None of this is in Scripture. But we've been fed that lie in order for them, for us, not to have the relationship with the Father that he wants us to have. We don't know the character of God if we believe in eternal damnation in this, in this way. If we think that God is going to keep people alive forever and ever and turn them over on a rotisserie and the devil gets to live forever, we don't know God. But that's what, most, that's what we've been taught through the church. Religion has taught us that that's the father we serve. Now, can you imagine somebody just learning about God and you tell them that that's how that works out? They say, no, thank you. I don't need a God that's going to be so cruel that he's going to keep me alive through eternity just to punish me. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say that. Now, Dante's Inferno says that. And all the other uh, 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 phil philosophical books that were given and embraced by this enemy thousands of years ago taught us this. We all believed it. What do you think Halloween? How many people, if you say, I'm going to dress up like the devil for Halloween, what are you putting on? Red suit with horns, pitchfork, tail, you know, bag of Skittles, something. That's that because what? That's what we've been programmed to think. If we really dressed up like the devil, we look like that character that played Lucifer in that television show. Yeah. Smooth. Yeah. I mean, smooth, good looking. You know, got the right thing to say, the right suit on, you know. That's the devil. Now, hold on, don't think. You, you can have a suit on without being the devil, so just, you know. That's y'all say you wear that, you're a devil. No, I did not. But that would be the representation if you were going to rightly represent Satan. He is a, he, he, he's a con man. He, he's, a, he's a liar. He can, he, can, he can confuse you at any point. And so, but what we're saying here is that God is not the God that they tell us he is. So we're looking in the scriptures to find out the true character of our father and the, and the destiny of those who don't follow them. And how that's going to happen. We got to know this so we'll get closer to the Father because the Father said he is love. Now, can love do this? Can love keep you alive forever and burn you up? Can love let sin live forever? No. If sin would live forever, what was the point of Christ coming? Amen. To give us the victory over sin. What we want to look at is the nature of the fire spoken here. And, and, and it is, a fire, is it a fire that purifies? Is it a fire that torments forever? Or is it a fire that consumes? Let's go to Matthew 10. See what Jesus said about that. 
Because that's some purifying fire, isn't it? Yeah, we in there now, aren't we, Brother Tony? <laughs> and there's a fire that torments, but it doesn't torment forever. See, forever is a very long time. And forever only belongs to the one who is eternal. Satan is not eternal. So how can sin be eternal? How should the pun punishment for sin, the execution of that punishment, be eternal? It cannot be. Now, let's read uh, Matthew chapter 10. In verse 27, the Lord says, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body, where? In hell. This execution process I got, I got an execution process. It's called burning that fire that consumes, because I'm going to consume sin forevermore. Amen? But he used this word destroy. So what's the purpose of the hellfire? It's to destroy sin. Okay? Now, Matthew 10, 28 is the same. In Matthew 10, 28, the word destroy is the same word as found in John 3, 16. It's the same word. Now, we know, everybody knows John 3, 16, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not what? The word perish and destroy is the same word in the original language. He said, I don't, those who believe in me, I will not destroy. But he said here, I'm going to destroy both soul and body of the wicked. So we see it's not, we got to understand what's going on here. The words just perish and destroy actually is a word uh, in the Greek uh, that's called apollium. A-P-O-L-L-U-M. Okay. It means to destroy fully. <laughs> it says to put out of the way entirely. So when he says, I'm going to destroy, I'm going to destroy fully. If you are still burning eight eons from now, you are not destroyed fully. Think about this. The, see, once you, the light goes on, you see the ridiculous nature of the lie but not many lights are going on because the darkness is so thick. No one's looking to find the light. They have accepted the Flint, Michigan water and said, that's Christ. Well, that's who your father is. Your father kills people. Your father hates, he hates, I said, he hates sin, loves the sinner. But how can he keep somebody alive forever, poking them and, and, and roasting them? And I said, the father, the Son or the Holy Ghost doesn't do that. Amen. But it gives Satan eternal life. That's why he tells you these things. See, if hell is a place where the demons and, 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 and Satan rule and hang out forever, it gives him eternal life. Therefore, God has no judgment on sin. Just the sinner. You see the difference? God didn't judge sin if that's the case. He just judged the sinner. God says, I'm judging the sin. I'm trying to keep you from being a sinner. Because I'm going to crush sin. I'm going to annihilate sin. I'm going to totally obliterate sin. And I'm going to be the father of it. I'm getting rid of him too. But I don't want to do that to you. You see the difference in how you would approach the father? If you believed in, in, in eternal uh, uh, damnation, as it relates to the way they talk about it or eternal judgment as God has talked about it. You'll, use, you'll see this word. You don't have to turn to these scriptures, but you'll see this word, destroy, perish, in, in, the, in, the, in the Greek, apolium, 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 A-P-O-L-L-U-M-I. I forgot the I. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> the disciples were about to perish in the storm. They use that word. That's in Matthew 8, 25. The Pharisees seek to destroy Jesus. That's Matthew 12, 14. This is the same word, okay? We don't, we, the disciples thought they were going to die. They didn't think they were going to hell. They thought they were going to die and be destroyed, okay? And what else? The Pharisees taught to kill Christ, right? Hell wasn't involved in that, but it's the same word, destroy, okay? 
Someone loses their life trying to save it. Remember in Matthew 16, 25, Christ talked about that. So, uh, 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 and more examples. The king sends his troops to destroy murderers in Matthew 27, 22, 7. These, these uses the same word to, descri this, to, to describe the same event, to destroy utterly. Amen? Yeah. And, 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 oh, there's so many more. I just have to send that to you. Y'all don't have time for this. See, the high priest says it's better that one man die. Remember that? Yes. Then the whole nation perish. The word perish, same word, utterly destroyed. That's in John eleven fifty. 50. Uh, the, the false Messiah perished at the hands of Rome. Uh, when we look at Acts chapter 5 and 37, somebody said they were, they were a, a, a prophet and they killed him. Many Israelites perished in the wilderness, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 9, 10, and, and were destroyed. And then in Jude chapter 5, it talks about a destroying fire. Some people perished in the rebellion of Korah. That word perish, according to the book of Jude, verse 11, is the same word we use when God so loved the world. He didn't want you to perish. So the word perish and destroy means the same thing, to utterly get rid of. And we read earlier about, what do, we, what do words you use? Stubble, ashes, burn up, okay? There's a finality to the execution. We were told that eternal agony was described using a few words. Anybody ever heard of weeping and gnashing? Go to Luke. Weeping and gnashing has nothing to do with agony. No, it has nothing to do with pain. We're going to find that out. Y'all ready to find this out? Luke 13. Because every time it's used, it talks about the same thing. But we've been told that it's, huh, huh, I'm going to be so much pain, I'm going to chew on myself. Eternal pain. God said, let's look in the Bible and see where this, this term is used. In Luke chapter 13. Luke 13. We begin at verse 26. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in the, thy presence, and, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not, whence you, you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, let's stop there. Let's keep reading this verse. He said, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves are thrust out. What we're going to find is every time he, he talked about weeping and gnashing, it was a, a realization that they were thrust out of the kingdom. Is that, is that pain, in a sense, physical? No. It's a little different, isn't it? Let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 30, 24, I'm sorry, in verse 50. Because we've been told weeping and gnashing of teeth means what? Agony in the fire. Didn't say that, did it? Now let's go here to Matthew 24, in verse 50. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with who? The hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here we go again. I'm going to appoint you your portion. I'm going to separate you from me. You're going to be over there with the hypocrites. And that's when you're going to say, oh, I missed it. You're going to be in agony, but it's not going to be physical. You've been put out of the kingdom. And that's when the weeping and gnashing of teeth occur. That's what overcomes you. You're going to have so much emotional pain. It, it, it is that kind of pain, but it has nothing to do with anybody chewing on you. Or you suffering, phys you, you're weeping and gnashing because you're on fire. That doesn't say that. It's always about when you are being separated, when the final judgment comes and you are separated from those who re receive the reward of God and you get to see it and say, I had a chance for that. He kept trying to pull me into this wonderful reality. He kept trying to tell me these things, but I wouldn't listen. I was so caught up in myself that I didn't hear the voice of God. And now I see this and I could have had this. You will be weeping. 
We don't want to be weeping, do we? See, these two verses describe the anger that's felt when you got kicked out. Man, you're going to be angry. But ain't nobody's fault but yours. You might, find, you might look to be angry. You might look to your pastor. You knew this and didn't tell us. You might look to your denomination and say, why did you teach us this lie? Then you, you get and move up to Satan himself. Why did you deceive us? And God's going to say, you had your shot. I gave you my son on a cross to forever be looking like you. I changed. He changed himself to save you. What else could I do for you? I sent my angel. I sent my spirit I, to whisper into your ear, choose me. I've gave you example after example of the goodness of God, but yet you turned your back. What else could I do? And, 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 and even in the, if we find ourselves, before this happens, of course, even when you found yourself in the waste howling wilderness, I came and got you. What else can I do? And when that, all that flashes before you, they're going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because you're going to say, I could have had this. He said, all I wanted you to do was experience me. I wanted you to come back to what I made you to be, my image. I wanted you to have eternal glory with me, eternal joy with me, eternal happiness. And now you got to face the ashes. Mm, mm, mm. It always talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth in Matthew 8, 11, in Matthew 22, 13, in Matthew 25, 30, it always talks about outer darkness. You've been cast out into outer darkness. You've been cast away from the light forever. What a horrible experience that's going to be. Cast away forever, never to have any hope, never to return. And you will receive the reward of the wicked one. Because you've got to remember the execution judgment was not made for man. It was made for Satan and his angels. But guess what? We chose him. Therefore, we get him and all that comes with him. Lord, help us. Yeah. Yeah. The only time we see weeping and gnashing of teeth that has something to do with violence is Acts chapter 7. You remember Acts chapter 7? There was a, a light standing in the midst of the church. His name was Stephen. And Stephen kept preaching. Stephen, Stephen kept being the light. Stephen started to tell them that you were about to be cast out into outer darkness. Now let's see what happened. Because there was a statement made. There was an action made right after this happened. We're talking about being separated from God. Now, we're in Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. When we talked about weeping and gnashing, there was, a, there's, there's a, there was an action that was about to happen after this, that this group of people, I didn't say all of Israel, but this group of Israelites were going to be separated. And let's see what happened. Acts chapter 7, verse 52 says, Which of the prophets have your, not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before you, before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now <laughs> been the, what, the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. He was talking about, he was actually describing the final judgment and what would cause the judgment to occur. When they heard those things, they were cut to the heart. They weren't in physical agony, were they? They were cut to the heart. And th then they started doing what? They gnashed on him with their teeth. They were so angry. They gnashed on him with his teeth. Have you ever been that mad before? Oh, when you were little, you always had a kid on the playground that would bite. All, every playground from Chicago to Memphis, there was always a kid that would be, would have been a biter. They come and say, ah! And I'm talking about we five, six years old, you know. 
And they get so angry, they go, ah, I try to bite you. That's the kid you hit in the mouth. Like Tyson. Yeah, just bop. Tyson bit my man's ear off. <laughs> Everybody says, mm -hmm. because there's anger. Tyson wasn't hurt, he was angry. This kid wasn't hurt, he was angry. These people were angry. It wasn't pain they were suffering from. They weren't gnawing on him because they were on fire. So when God uses these terms, let's find out what context they were being used in. It was always about the separation, the final judgment. Psalm 112, Psalm 112. See, we're trying to take what they've given us and show the error of it. They told us that the weeping and gnashing of teeth justify the, the, the position that we were gonna live forever and be gnashing on ourselves. They told us that the fire was going to burn forever. That means that sin was gonna live forever. We found that that didn't quite add up in the scriptures. Now let's go to Psalm 112. Just for another gnash of the teeth to explain to us what that really is. Psalm 112 and verse 9. Psalm 112 and verse 9. He that dispersed, he hath dispersed, I'm sorry. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it. <laughs> you know, when, the, when God gives the gift. The wicked shall see it and be what? Grieved. Grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away, the desire of the wicked shall perish. So don't let people tell you that weeping and gnashing of teeth justifies eternal fire. It doesn't. It's not even in the Bible. It might be in their whatever book they use, but it's not in the Word. Amen? Amen. So let's go down here and let's talk about this. We got a little bit more time. See, there's an ad the adjective eternal means permanent. Put that in your head first, okay? And it's the result of the action. Eternity, your eternity, is a result of an action, amen? Not the action <laughs> that produces the result. Let's see if I can explain that. The execution is not eternal but the result is eternal. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, uh, like if I had a, a, a match and I picked one of these leaves out, okay, and I take that match and I light this leaf, the leaf is not going to burn forever, but it'll be forever burned. It'll be burned up. It's no more leaf and it's never gonna be a leaf again. That's eternal. The result is eternal, okay? The, the, the operation is not, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Now, let's look at the five words, <laughs> at these five words one by one, okay? Let's look at this, the, 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 what's called eternal. What is permanent in eternal salvation? Is it the process of salvation? Or is it the result of salvation? Okay? The thing that constitutes forever is the salvation that results, not the process of saving. It's not the process of saving that's eternal. It's the result of the saving that's eternal. Also, in the same way, eternal redemption results, results from redeeming that actually stops. Christ redeems us. Okay, what does redeem mean? He bought us back, right? Okay. Did he, how many times did he die? Once. He died once for us. He re, his, his death redeems us, right? He doesn't die all the time. Redemption is, has an end. The result is eternal. Okay? We all right so far? Okay? Eternal judgment, then, is the result of the judging that ends. Okay? It's the result of it. Okay, he said eternal punishment results from the punishment that stops and destroying will not continue without end, but the destruction that results will be everlasting. Are we, are we, we got me. We're good with this. 
We got to realize that. That's, that's the eternal deal. People get you on that eternal, it's going to go on forever. The result is forever. The operation is not. But all oh, if I got you focusing on the operation, you'll never see this. All we'll see is hell, fire, and ashes. Now, we won't see ashes, I forgot, because you never burn up. You're always there. Um, now, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians 1. And the reason we're looking at this today is in this series that we're talking about, they took Christ from us. They took our father from us. And it's, he, wants to give, he wants to give us our relationship back. And so he's, he, what he's doing, what did we find out the last two weeks? The exact time Christ was born. And so now we, we never, ever, 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 Eternally, we'll never believe the lie. <laughs> and we didn't leave the Bible, did we? He said, oh, okay, that, 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 oh, there you go. And we, 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 this, today, we didn't, get like, we didn't do the things like that because we desperately don't want you to start worshiping a day. Because it, it doesn't even matter. It was just a result of a lie that we wanted to make sure that you knew the lie was a lie. And that you understood that God is always in control and he's always on time. And everything he does is by his calendar. Now we got that one, right? So now we're going to see, oh, even the judgment God is in control of. Even the operation and the execution God is in charge of. And the devil can't make that change. Even though he wants to make you think he can. The devil really wants to tell you I'm eternal. I'm eternal because I run hell. And y'all going to be burning forever. Now that sounds so stupid to us, but years ago it didn't. Because every church I went to before the age of 17 told me that. Remember that song they used to sing? That's all I was telling you about what you're going to do when the world start burning. Where you going to run to? And man, as a five-year-old, you know that, what that does to you? You go to sleep and huh, you're looking out the window to see if it's on fire. And the moon's going to turn to blood. And, and then you go outside and, you know, in, in the, the, the days of the red moon, you know, when it's first going through this atmosphere and it looks like it's red and it's going to turn to blood. Don't you know what that did to me as a 10-year-old? I'm looking outside. I said, it's over. The moon's turning to blood. God's going to come kill us all. And I got all that from church. I said, what kind of God can do this? Think about how, how that shifts you as a child. And you wonder why when you turn 18, your, your, your children run as far away from church as they can. Because they said, I don't know what that is, but that don't make any sense. So I'm going to go out and try witchcraft. I'm going to go out and try something else. Because there's got to be some love somewhere. Do you know most people run to the occult because there's some feel, feel, feeling of attachment and unity and what they classify as love? And if you've been told the father kills people forever and ever and torments them ever and ever, and you say, well, hold on, I need another God. Do you see why this is important to know? I know they're going to tell you. Well, they used to. I, I, they're probably getting away from it now because there's no sin. So there's no, everybody going to heaven. Everybody going to heaven. Isn't that amazing? Everybody going to heaven because Christ came to save us all. Didn't say Christ is going to save all. He said he came to give you a possibility to be saved. But everybody going to heaven. I've never been to a funeral where somebody said, well, no, nah, he, nah, he ain't make it. <laughs> no, nah, that brother there. Mm -mm. I've always, I've seen People who were prostitutes, pimps, drug dealers, they own heaven, they own heaven. God's a good God. No, there's a judgment. And I want you all to understand, it's not, the, it's not the pimps and the prostitutes that you really need to be concerned with. Let's keep going. Second Thessalonians. 
Because God is not that, he's not that weigher of sin. Oh, that sin worth more than this sin. <laughs> he said, oh, that was against what I asked you to do. <laughs> I don't care if your name is Bishop, Evangelist, the most right reverend. You are practicing things that are going to cause you to experience the final judgment. So to stop looking out on the streets for sin. First place you look is in the mirror. And say, Lord, is it me? When at the disciples, they said, who, who, Christ told them, uh, one of y'all going to betray me. And the brother said, oh, is it me? Is it me? Has anybody ever asked that question about your betrayal to Christ? Is it me, Lord? And our God was so wonderful about it. He said, yes, yeah, you. But guess what? My grace is sufficient. Hmm. Now, come on now. Don't stay there. Come on. Every morning. Is it me, Lord? And then when you, when you understand, when you turn your back on your Savior, and your Savior doesn't turn his back on you, as a sister was bringing out this morning, about loving God loving you and you not loving him back. He said, that's going to be the problem. <laughs> but until I as God says, until I say that's enough or I'm done, then you got a chance. As long as there's life, there's hope. Amen. Amen. But you see this lie, how this lie can make you see or miss God. And we need love today. We need a God that loves us. We need to know that he does. And we need to be retrained if we don't know that. That God says, I so love the world. He didn't say, I so love the saints. He didn't say, I so love the righteous. He said, I so love the world that I did something that nothing, no one else could do. I gave you heaven. And I didn't take it back. That gift is still available for us. First Thessalonians chapter one, starting at verse seven. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with the mighty angels in flaming fire, doing something that we're talking about today, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with an everlasting what? He didn't say you're going to be punished everlastingly. He said, I'm going to punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. See, the, nick, the wicked will never be seen again. This is eternal capital punishment. Let me ask you something. When you, get, when you see somebody going to the electric chair, prayerful it ain't you, but does the electricity flow forever? But does the death, the first death, is it true? Does that person come back in this body, on this earth? He's dead for dead. As he said, he dead, dead. <laughs> Amen? And so when this second death happened, it's forever. It's eternal. But don't be mistaken, it's death. It's total, forever, cut off from life. Who is life? Can you see why, that, why, why, why God doesn't live in hell? Because for hell to live forever, God has to be there. Because he has the only one that can give life. The everlasting death penalty, the second death. Let's go to Jude and read verse 7. Talks about an eternal, an example of eternal fire. Verse 7 of Jude says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Do you see the example he gave us here? He called this eternal fire. Go over there now. It ain't, it's not fire, there's no fire there, but it's eternal. Sodom and Gomorrah are forever not here. Not coming back. Amen? That's eternal fire. See, it was not the, the, the operation that was eternal, but the result was. The fire was the method of, of, of the permanent. It was the method of the eternal punishment. 
The destruction was eternal and not the fire. So it makes sense? And one more last thing. Oh, Lord. People use a parable. Go ahead and go to Luke 16. People use this parable, and I repeat, this parable, to justify that there's some life in hell after death. And we're going to point out the ridiculous nature of believing. Though what You really have to be really confused. After we get through, you're going to say, hmm, that don't make sense. <laughs> See, the details you need to know about this. First of all, it's a parable, okay? Not history. Jesus was not giving a history lesson. He was not reaching back in the annals of time and tell you what happens in the eternal. He was giving you a parable. Didn't he have parables about fig trees? Didn't about planting, plucking, you know, sheeping, shepherding? (laughs) But you don't take that and try to put eternal life on it. Now look at this. It's a parable. It had a purpose. What he was saying, the purpose, the context concerns subjects not related to the final judgment. The parable had nothing to do with final judgment, period. He wasn't even talking about final judgment. Okay, what's the setting? He wasn't talking about the future, was he? Matter of fact, if you read the parable, it seems like it was happening now. You know, the guy just died, this guy just died. So it's not eternal. It's not future. He's not talking about some time when the second coming of Christ. And what was this intended to do? What what was the figurative versus the literal? So let's go to 16th chapter of Luke. I don't know if we're going to read all of it. Let's go to verse 15. First of all, he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. That's what this parable was all about. It was about self-justification of people who thought they were holy. That's what this was all about. But you kind of, when you, when you believe that other part, you kind of miss that scripture. So we're going to go down to 19. This is where they pick it up. There was a what? A certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. Now, remember when 15 said, he said, uh, ye are they which justify yourself before men. See, but you all esteem each other highly. He said, the things that you all think are real and important are an abomination to God. And so he starts the parable off talking about the things that people admire. I mean, people who admire. He did what? He had, uh, he was highly esteemed. So he had a reputation. Amen. And what else? Uh, He was rich. People love that. He was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. These are the things that man hold in great esteem. Remember, that's what this parable was about. He introduced the parable talking about the subject. Verse 20 said, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. Now, of course, man doesn't esteem a beggar. He doesn't think his life is good. Amen. So you see, he's, he's setting up the dichotomy. He's setting up the differences, right? He's saying, you all think that this is what's worth. This is great of great value. And you think that this is not great value. Okay, let's keep reading. We, we, are, we are so far? Verse 21. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came. And licked his soul. I don't think Jesus could have painted a a more awful picture. That every worldly thing this man did not possess. He didn't have esteem. I mean, nobody thought he was good. He didn't have food. He he asked for crumbs that fall from the tables. And even the dogs licked his sores. Now, we got that picture. We got rich man who got it all. We got poor man who got nothing. Remember, God is saying, remember in verse 15, he said, I know the heart. I'm judging the heart. And so then he gave this parable. Verse, where we at? Verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels unto Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, 
being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Once we dissect this, you're going to really feel stupid if you ever believe this. And he said, verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus. <laughs> Gee, my name, these people are terrible. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in the flame. Do you see, keep in mind what Christ was talking about. Do you see how awful this person is? He still thinks he's better than Lazarus. Even though he is in the, 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 uh, myth, uh, the, the uh, mythical hell. He said, even though he's down there burning, even though he has received the, the, the reward of the wicked, he still has put himself higher than, than Lazarus. He won't even talk to Lazarus. He said, Father Abraham, he still thinks he's a child of the Most High. Because why? Because he had valued the things of that earth. And so he thought that that was the value of heaven. I'm rich. I can do this. I'm well known. He said, I'm, the, I'm a son of Abraham. So he talked to Abraham and said, Father Abraham, have mercy. Send Lazarus. Dip his finger in, 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 so I can have a, little, a drink. Let me ask you something. If you were burning, would a drop of water help you? So you kind of figure this ain't talking about second death. It's not talking about final judgment. This is talking about the reality of what we think is good and what God thinks is good. Verse 27. No, I'm sorry. Verse 26. And besides all this between... No, I'm sorry. Man, I'm way off. I'm sorry. Verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou... In thy lifetime receive the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he might testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And you believe, we did believe, that they was talking about the final judgment. Christ said, I wasn't talking about that at all. I was trying to check these church folks who think they got it going on. And they think that I see things like they see them. He was saying, I see Lazarus. Even though Lazarus went through all of what he went through, he came with me. You see what the parable was about? Finally, the parable... It shouldn't be read literally, right? Because it's a parable. Let me tell you what you're going to have to believe if you believe this is literal. It would require you to believe that Abraham receives the godly dead. Where in the scriptures is Abraham receiving the godly dead? Can't find it. But you got to believe that if you think this is, is what he's talking about, the final judgment. You got to believe that Abraham is in charge. He's at the gate. And he's, he's the father. He's the one that receives. Help us, Lord. You got to believe that the angels transport the godly dead from earth to Abraham. Have, have you seen that in the scriptures? You got to believe also that the godly and ungodly, though they're apart, are both audible and visible to each other. Somewhere in the Bible says the dead know not anything. Oh, I guess we just throw that out. You know, we don't, we don't need no scripture. Yeah. He said, all the works of, of what you do is done. How can, we, how can the, 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 the dead and the living speak to one another? But you've got to believe that if you believe this is a literal description of the relationship at the final judgment. You see, every point that it, to, to you for I to believe that this is, is what God was trying to do, we have to throw the rest of the Bible out. 
Also, you got to believe that the saved can theoretically travel to the unsaved. We got to believe that they can come back to earth. The Bible says that's not, that's not what happens. I always thought about that when my mother died. And of course, everybody, I was five, and everybody was saying, baby, she, she's looking after you. Now, I don't know about you, but I was a boy. And boys always got into things. And I always worried, I worried for a little while, mama see me. Because I remember when she was alive and she saw me, there'd be some repercussions, some consequences. And so then I said, well, then I got a little older. I'm like, wow. But she can't do nothing. And then I, you know, then I got a little old and I said, man, that, that would be horrible for my mother to see me go through something and, and about to, you know, be in, and she couldn't do anything. Wouldn't that be horrible as a, as a parent, as a loved one, that you would say, oh, they're about to, and you, all you can do is sit there and watch. Then it started to click. That's not God. God is not cruel. God would not do that. If your grandmother is, is, is in the clay, she's in the clay. The spirit of life has returned to the giver of life. And we pray one day those things will hook up again when life comes and we're caught up in the air to meet because the dead in Christ will rise first. And this is what we look forward to. But you can't rise if you're not there. Does that make sense? If you're already in heaven, how are you going to rise? That was another question I asked. I said, what happens? Like two minutes before it gets here, they go back in the ground? Because the scripture said the dead in Christ will rise first. He didn't say those in heaven going to rise because if they were in heaven, they wouldn't have to rise. That's why the devil doesn't want you to read. And they didn't want you to read with the understanding. He doesn't want you to read with the spirit of God. They want you to take the word of a pastor. They want to take the word of the doctrine. They want you to take the word of the religion. They don't want you to take the word of God because the word of God will show the error of them. That's why the Jews wanted to kill Christ because his very existence showed the error of their belief system. Lord, help us. See, the wicked will, will always be separated from the good, y'all. And we don't want that to happen to us. Will we live for God? You got, you got five minutes? Oh, like you're going to say no. Huh? 20. 20. <laughs> I don't. So you got to remember the point is what will happen to the wicked, not where the wicked is, are going. The point is what will happen to those who don't believe, not how they'll be executed. See, the wicked will, will be ever separated from the good. The wicked will be ever separated from the joy. They'll be ever separated from the love of God and the happiness that comes with eternal companionship with Christ. That's a horrible, horrible moment in time. Second Thessalonians 1. So nobody can come to you with the, the parable of Lazarus, Lazarus and tell you that that justifies. Well, see, it says by Abraham. Abraham, yeah. I'm telling you something about Abraham. He's not welcoming nobody to, the, to heaven. I'm telling you something about the angels. The angels don't carry you anywhere. And it was just amazing when you see the arrogance of the rich people. You know, that hadn't changed much. If a man is a trillionaire, and loses all of his fortune, he's still going to act like that. And you know what's sad about us? We broke as Job's turkey and still act like that. Get $1,000, thank you, the king of the hill. <laughs> Help us, Lord. <laughs> 1,200. Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 says, And to you who are troubled... Again, rest with us. God says that there's a punishment. 
Let's go to verse 10. When he shall come to be glorified with his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. He said, you all won't be like that. You all are going to see the salvation of God because you believe in him. Amen. Now, don't, I want you to understand, don't think that this destruction is going to happen instantaneously. Romans chapter 8 teaches us, Romans chapter 2 teaches us that. See, we think that, oh, okay, well, there's no, no, no eternal fire. Oh, it's going to be some fire. Let's go to Romans 2. Let's go, it's going to be some pain. So don't think you can sin and just get off scot-free. Who me? I ain't got, I can worry about burning forever. Ooh, I can just do what I want to do. Boy, girl, mm-mm. First of all, your life, heal, your life here is going to be hell. See, that's what people don't get. We talked about this this morning. People don't get the fact that you can have heaven now. You can live eternally now. You can have God's life now. And that's what this is about. Make the relationship now so you can prepare for the relationship forever. Your life will be totally different if you accept Christ. If you decide, I don't want to walk in the world any longer. Your life will change for the good. We talked about this one of those Bible studies this week, <laughs> that, man, if you just follow the way, things are good. Y'all believe that? You follow his way, things get good. Do you know if you're married and follow the way of God, your marriage is going to be good? Can you imagine having a marriage? People, if everybody would stop committing adultery, life would be good for them, wouldn't it? But you know how many people go to bed every night worried about that? I wonder where they are. Oh, God, y'all, y'all know, I don't apply none of y'all, but y'all know somebody. Are you, are you not worried about, uh, you know, when you go by the way of God? You know, I'm not really worried about uh, dying of alcohol poison. Why? I'm not drinking. <laughs> I don't worry. Lanai's, that I'm going to get shot at the club at 3 o'clock in the morning. Why? I'm not there because I'm walking away. Things, that, they don't even come across your mind anymore. Why? Because you walk in the way of God. That's why he said, I want you to have this way now. See, we're preparing for the eternal uh, salvation, the, the eternal uh, gift of God, which is eternal life, but we've we, we got to do it now. And he said, now is the time. And if you do it now, you'll start experiencing just a touch of what heaven's all about. I don't know about y'all, but I believe that I don't spend a moment of my life worrying about what I told somebody because I don't lie to them. I don't have to worry, Jasmine, that, 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 that what did I tell them again? <laughs> now, now, I said this, and I got to make sure I keep that lie going. You know, that's not part of my life. And then that, that's fun, isn't it? It's good. You don't have to worry about that. You know the people who do? They get up in the morning, oh, Lord, what did I say? Okay, I told her this. I told him that. Hope they don't meet. You know, that's something we, 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 we uh, apply when we do uh, mar- couple marriage counseling. Uh, there are often times we talk to each one separately, but we always going to talk to them together. Mm-hmm. And oh, when you do that. See, the only reason that we try to do it sometimes separately is because the other won't open up with the presence of the other one. But also you have to take into account, they're pretty much going to tell you 50% of the truth. And if 50% is true, what's the other 50%? And so when you get the 50 and the 50 coming in, you might find the truth. And they worry about that. A lot of couples won't meet with me together because they've been talking to me separately and just been lying. Are they married? Yeah, they're lying. Man, he does this, he does this, and she does this, she does this. Get together and, oh, that's a lie. No, 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 that's all right. What do you mean that's all right? I thought y'all wanted this fixed. Lord help us. So that's, a, that's just a hint for all you couples that have met with me or, and Sister Shaw. You know, that's what we're doing. So you're going to meet with us. 
Because, and oftentimes what we find is wonderful about this, there's just been some misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. They thought they said this, but they really didn't. I didn't say that. I thought you said, but baby, I didn't say that. And then you, have, you got love all over the place. <laughs> but if you live by the way of God, you don't have to worry about the lies that you told. Amen. So that's why I'm saying it's so wonderful living in the way of God. But I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be some destruction. Romans chapter 2. Oh, Lord, it's 120. Get out of here. One, Romans chapter 2 and verse 8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. That's what's coming. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. See, no one should think that the wicked will simply go quietly asleep. This is not an easy demise, y'all. The second death is not a peaceful death. It's a death, but it ain't peaceful. And we read about this in Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his right hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be what? Tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So this is not going to be a picnic. The second death is a final death. There will not be for, but there will be an end to sin. Sin and all that participate in it will have an end. And you know what happened? What's the most beautiful part of this? It will never rise again. There will never be a Satan again. There'll never be an adversary again. There'll never be an accuser again. There'll never be death again. There'll never be pain again. There'll never be uh, uh, tears. This is what's promised us if we would simply believe. This is what Satan does not want us to know. And this is why he taught us this lie all these years. Now your eyes are open. So there's no more what? Abraham talking to Lazarus. There's no more dipping your finger in the water and giving. There's no more of that. There's no more what? There's no more Sodom and Gomorrah beliefs. There are no more uh, opportunities for us to be fooled and say that the Father will torment us forever because his word and his spirit say that is not the truth. So let us walk in truth. And let's see what else the Lord is going to take the veil off of. Let's have a word of prayer.